welcome to the uh, City of Davis's Eco Series uh, of classes, I suppose is uh, how we put that. My name is John McNerney. I'm the city's wildlife resource specialist. Um, and today I will be presenting on uh, urban wildlife. Uh, we'll take a look at uh, why urban wildlife do so well here at the City of Davis, but we'll also take a look at some of the problems that we might have with them and then um, uh, some of the things that the city does to um, help residents work through some of those issues that they might have. Um, I'm going to try to get this thing to work, hit the right button. Uh, so this is basically what I would like to talk about today. Uh, we're going to look at those habitat types, um, the species composition. It's not going to be a thorough species composition for the city. Obviously, we have a lot of wildlife, um, but we'll look at some of the uh, more usual, usual suspects. Uh, we'll call the charismatic megafauna, the larger species that are easy to identify. Um, and we'll also look at some of the conflicts and conflict resolution. Uh, some of the planning elements, and then hopefully at the end we'll have some time for questions and answers. So City of Davis is uh, kind of unique in the sense that it offers quite a bit of habitat. And there's uh, different types of habitats that we find here, including urban uh, habitat. There's about 10 square miles of urban area in the City of Davis, and that includes 400 acres of parks, um, which is parks in Greenbelt, so we kind of blend those together in that figure. Um, there's also uh, what we'll call remnant or restored uh, native habitat areas. So these would be uh, areas, for example, like South Fork Puda Creek, which was once upon a time a, a real living creek and supported uh, riparian vegetation. It still remains. It no longer uh, carries creek water, but uh, the uh, the habitat is still there, and it's still a very, uh, um, a very important uh, habitat for wildlife here. Uh, but we also have some restoration areas that the city has uh, uh, spent some time restoring, planning, restoring to make uh, better for wildlife. Um, it's also agriculture. You know, some people scratch scratch their head and say, "Well, how's agriculture habitat?" But it certainly is. Hello. Um, and there's a roughly about 200 acres of ag easements that the city holds around the city of Davis, not necessarily in the city, but right on the edges and uh, just a little ways away. So that was important to mention those. Um, you can see uh, aerial city of Davis uh, here. You guys are all familiar with this. Um, interesting thing to point out though is that the urban area here, largely outlined by yellow, is an island in a sea of agriculture, so it's all around us. Um, that is, uh, it can really help uh, to support some species that are agricultural dependent. Hello, how are you? Um, but also, uh, the, as I'd mentioned before, we have an extensive green belt uh, and park system, which lends well for species that forage out in agriculture to be able to come in and find cover to nest in town. So let's take a look at a few of uh, the areas that we have. Are you able to see if I'm standing here? I kind of have to, all right. Because um, we can also clear a section over here if it's easier. OK. Um, so when we consider urban habitat, we're looking at things like drainage cor corridors. So these are stormwater drainage uh, facilities. This happens to be the uh, Covell drainage channel. Um, and you can see there's important elements, water, uh, nice uh, um, native vegetation, trees, shrubs, grasses, uh, all of those are very important for wildlife. Uh, we also have streetscapes and uh, green belts, which offer a different type of habitat. It's a little more monoculture and turf grass and, and some of the trees there, but it's still important. Uh, parks, as I mentioned before, there's a lot of them and same kind of thing, a lot of turf grass, but uh, trees uh, and shrubs and other things that uh, offer cover for wildlife. Um, and then, of course, our backyards. You know, each, each one of us has a little micro habitat in our backyard. Um, we can say that I don't. Ours has been hammered by the uh, chicken and chickens and the dog, but, uh, you know, we do what we can to try to attract uh, wildlife when we can. Um, uh, and then jumping into the created and remnant habitat, um, you guys are familiar with the city's agricultural buffer areas. We have a really nice example of that up, uh, around the north part of Davis, the El Macero, uh agricultural buffer, um, as well as the wild, uh, 
I'm sorry, that's the wild horse agricultural buffer in the north, and down to the south, the Almacero uh, ag buffer, not quite as um, extensive as a wild horse ag buffer, but it still uh, offers a considerable amount of habitat. And these ag buffers are unique in the sense that they do border agriculture and residential habitat. So you have urban habitat, you have agriculture, and then you have this strip of uh, natural habitat in between, which can really increase diversity and, and abundance of wildlife. Uh, stormwater retention basins, very similar to the conveyance channels. These are uh, areas where we collect stormwater, offer uh, sometimes permanent year-round water. That's the goal, but uh, in the recent years, it's been difficult to maintain water in there without any rainfall. I'm sorry, these are, uh, let's see, we have the core area pond. This is also known as the dog park pond. Um, it's off of Second Street next to Sudworks. Um, this one is the North Area Pond. Uh, that's up in North Davis off of F Street. Uh, and the West Area Pond, which is in West Area, uh, West Davis, uh, uh, Lake. Clearest, the closest intersection would be Covell and Lake. It's, it's kind of a large uh, L-shaped uh, detention basin in there. Um, and all of these are uh, very attractive to a lot of different wildlife, but more importantly for waterfowl and shorebirds when there's water available for them. Uh, we kind of mentioned the Poudre Creek uh, Parkway. This is along the remnant north fork of Poudre Creek. Uh, no longer carries that water, but it still offers imp uh, important habitat. And then right adjacent to the uh, Poudre Creek Parkway remnant north fork, we have the Woodbridge Natural Area. And this is uh, one of the city's earlier attempts to use the existing riparian corridor, the trees and the shrubs along the creek there, but then to spread it out and mimic a a uh, natural floodplain, if you will, uh, where we see a transition down from large trees to smaller grasses and shrubs. Are these accessible? These are all accessible so far. Um, this is, uh, you could take the Poudre Creek bike path, so if you uh, are familiar with that bikeway down along Poudre Creek, uh, the best way to get there would probably be from here, let's say, is to take, um, Let's see, you could take pole line down, just take, stay on pole line to Drummond, take Drummond down to the end, and then you can pick up the bikeway there. Um, if you go to the east, you pick up a lot of the riparian. Actually, you could go either way from that point and still be in those habitat areas. Um, and of course, agriculture, and this is one of the city's uh, Holdings, there's no easements out there, but it's just an example of uh, a crop type, which is very beneficial to uh, Swainson's foraging. This is alfalfa. Um, there are other crop types that will support um, lots of different uh, birds of prey. Uh, not so much good for nesting, uh, especially for, for birds because of the disturbance level associated with agricultural practices. Um, other elements that we find here locally that will support wildlife uh, is the beautiful tree canopy that Davis supports. So we have trees everywhere here. We have a very uh, mature urban forest, um, an extensive greenbelt system, and that's important not only for the cover and the food that those uh, greenbelts provide wildlife, but also the corridors that they provide for those animals to move through and around uh, the city. Um, the city urban areas just are uh, a little more environmentally stable as far as uh, uh, the climate goes. Uh, we tend to be warmer on average just because of all the cement and concrete, asphalt. Um, it heats up during the day and then it releases it back into the environment at night. And that can be a benefit to some wildlife species. They have to use less energy to thermoregulate so they don't have to shiver quite as much uh, to maintain their body temperature. Um, which makes them more fit to be able to reproduce. Um, they're finding, there's actually a lot of research on that, and they're finding there's some great benefits uh, to these urban environments for wildlife and for that particular reason. Uh, there's also plenty of food. You know, we have lots of things. Humans provide lots of food for them. Uh, things like garbage, pet food, fruits and nuts that were grown in our backyard or in the green belts, but also water. So we're irrigating those things and uh, water tends to hopefully not put, puddle up too much because uh, we are trying to conserve that, um, but it happens. Uh, a lot of times 
things like squirrels can even gnaw into irrigation and cause issues there. Um, here's just an example of our uh, greenbelt system. So everything in blue is either a park or a greenbelt. And you can kind of see, um, I like to envision this as, um, you know, all the blue as, as uh, like our body's uh, circulatory system. And you can see anywhere these blue kind of reach in are kind of like capillaries. And if you think of wildlife as blood cells, um, they can move freely into here and access all these different resources in here. That can be a good thing for the wildlife. It can be a good thing for people who enjoy wildlife, but it can also be a problem for folks who are challenged uh, uh, or have conflict with wildlife in their backyards or at home. Um, so talk a little bit about what kind of species we see here in the city. Uh, we have the whole gamut, you know, running from mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians. We have them all. Uh, we have protected species like the burrowing owl, uh, Swainson's hawk, other birds of prey, uh, owls, for example, great horned owls, um, white-tailed kites. Uh, but we also have a whole host of migratory birds, and these are birds that uh, are here during the summertime, but then they'll transition and move down to lower climates uh, uh, during the winter where it's a little bit warmer. Um, those are protected under the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and therefore they uh, receive a little additional protection, uh, specifically when it comes to their nesting. Um, we also have some locally uh, rare species, but they're not necessarily protected. They might be abundant in the state of California uh, and or regionally, but not here in Davis. And so we are uh, certainly interested in, in protecting those as best we can. Uh, like the Sacramento, uh, sorry, Sacramento Valley red fox and the yellow-billed magpie. I can't remember the last time I've seen a yellow-billed magpie here in town, which is, uh, they used to be all over the place. In fact, quite annoying, but now they're rare to see. A uh, whole host of common species uh, here, uh, examples like this uh, uh, common, or, uh, common crow acorn woodpeckers, there's also a few other woodpecker species that we host, um, Cooper's hawks, barn owls, uh, morning dove on the far side there, far side there and um, uh, the wild turkeys, which cause a lot of people a headache here in town. Um, some of the mammals that we'll see around here, uh, ground squirrels, very common all around, tree squirrels. Uh, this is the eastern fox squirrel becoming more and more abundant around town. Uh, this is a non-native uh, invasive species, highly invasive. It's moved like wildfire through the city. Um, and so it's a new uh, challenge for a lot of folks at home. Uh, we also have uh, rats, so both the Norway rat and the black rat or a roof rat, um, raccoons, and then uh, the uh, black-tailed jackrabbit there with its giant ears. Um, and what I didn't put on here, which we certainly see a lot of, are the cottontail, the desert cottontails super cute with their fluffy tails. Um, here are some of the reptiles we see. Uh, these pretty much represent all three snakes that we may encounter around town. Um, this is the green racer. It's a, a really strikingly beautiful snake in a very simple way. It has a kind of an olive green or an avocado green uh, backside and a yellow uh, underside. These ones you see very briefly because they're very quick and they're very elusive. So they tend to, um, once they see you, usually before you see them, they, they run away pretty quick. Um, another very common one is the gopher snake or also known as a bull snake. Um, that's probably the most common here in town. And uh, bull snake, some people call them a bull snake, yeah. The gopher snake is the preferred common name, I suppose. Um, this one here is a, a garter snake. Uh, that one happens to be a common garter snake, but we do have terrestrial garter snakes and quite possibly on the edges of town, maybe even a little further than the edges of town, the giant garter snake, which is a, a state and federal threatened species. Um, and then the western fence lizard. These guys are all over the place in the green belts and ag buffers around town. Um, very much a source of entertainment for our, uh, our dog as we walk her through there. We have no poisonous snakes. Uh, on occasion, I will 
take a step back and say that every once in a while we will see rattlesnakes. Um, they're generally, they show up in the fall into winter time, um, and, that, and they usually occur near water bodies. So Puda Creek, for example, maybe Willow Slough Bypass. Um, and that's a result of them literally being washed out of the foothills where their preferred habitat is. Um, so those first rain events can cause logs to dislodge where they might be estivating, and those logs flow down and they haul themselves out and then they hang out. Um, generally, not a lot of cover for them, uh, and they tend to be predated pretty rapidly, so we don't have breeding populations down here. Um, the three amphibian, or uh, actually there's more than just three, but these are the common toads and frogs that we have. Western toad is at the top there, uh, bullfrog, and the Pacific chorus frog. Um, but we also see some other uh, uh, amphibians. We have a slender salamander, which uh, lives, again, closer to creeks. Their preferred habitat is up in the foothills, but they end up washing down as well. Um, some people find them in their backyard log pile, so it leads me to believe that there used to be sustainable populations along Poudre Creek, and as Davis developed, it took some of their habitat away, but they still persist in these little isolated pockets, which is pretty cool. Um, and then a few other uncommon protected, burrowing owl, Swainson's hawk, uh, and the um, Sac Valley red fox. And we do have a denning, um, it's not really a population, it's a, a, a den or a female who continues to den down along the remnant North Fork Poudre Creek. And that's, uh, that's pretty special, you know, there's not too many urban denning uh, Sac Valley red foxes. Another little interesting side note is that this is just recently identified as a subspecies of red fox. Um, before all red fox that were observed in the valley were uh, suspected to be of a eastern, um, ex ex an eastern subspecies of red fox that had escaped. It was non-native. The only native red fox that um, had been identified were the Sierra Nevada red fox population at very high elevations in the Sierra. But they found that there are unique markers to these um, Sac Valley red fox that are more closely related to the Sierra Nevada red fox population than they are the Eastern. Um, so they were able to designate those as a, a specific subspecies that are native to California, which is pretty neat too. Okay, so jumping into some of the conflicts that we see with our uh, wild friends. Um, there's really kind of two classifications when you look at conflict, there's generally two sides. Um, and so what I've done here is broken it out into wildlife as the problem. And a lot of the uh, issues that we see are, uh, can be related to public health and safety issues, um, but also aesthetic impacts. And we'll it'll dive into that a little bit more later. Uh, property damage can be a, a, a common conflict with wildlife. Uh, resource competition, so going back to the fruits and nuts and vegetables that we all adore in our backyard, um, so, do, so does other life. You know, it's food, everybody wants to get in on the action. Um, and then what I'll call space invasion, and I'll explain that in a little bit. But there's also humans as the problem. You know, the wildlife aren't always the, the culprit in the equation, um, we create habitat for them, therefore we attract them. We also remove habitat that we've created for them and or that they were occupying. So we're kind of forcing them into places where they might not necessarily want to be, but they can certainly be there and we are there too. So we are now in close proximity to each other. Um, disturbance. So you know, any kind of uh, noise, excavation, you know, going out, running the dog around a, a sensitive nest site. Um, those types of disturbances can really impact wildlife. Um, feeding is a real problem, and that's probably the root of most of the urban wildlife problems that we have. Um, but then on the other side, some of those food indirectly uh, uh, offered or being accessed by especially birds of prey um, may have eaten poisons that we put out. So rat poison, for example, can be a real problem. Um, the, the problem with rat poison is the, sec the non-target secondary poisoning. So for example, a rat would come along, eat some of that poison, run off, 
be really sick because it's poison and it's an easy prey item for hawks. So the hawk comes down, eats it, it ingests the poison and it uh, suffers the same similar fate. Uh, and then just lack of tolerance. So we have uh, cases where people just don't like having the wildlife in their yard. They're not causing them any problems other than being there. So um, that's, that can be a common, common conflict. But we also see wildlife versus wildlife conflict. So it's not all just humans and wildlife battling out. Sometimes it's uh, uh, between different species of wildlife. Um, and, and the common, co uh, common problem is non-native invasive species. So we see a lot of these um, non-natives which have either established naturally or were brought in and, and released like the eastern fox squirrel. Um, uh, but Canada geese are a non-native breeder to California. They migrate down here, they spend their winters down here, but the natural populations lift up, fly up to Canada and breed up there. But now we see them uh, living in urban areas because they like the golf courses we provide for them, very much like the Arctic tundra. Um, they also like our stormwater tension basins. It's a nice place, there's great food, I don't have to move very far, and then there's plenty of agriculture around. Um, urban areas are also, uh, uh, they're, they're missing the, the main predators of those guys. So uh, predation is very low and they're able to be very successful in their breeding. Um, European starling is another one. They're very lovely song to hear, uh, but they can be a problem because they, uh, they're nest parasites. So they'll lay their eggs and other birds nests and then their young grow quicker than those birds. And so the, the natural uh, chicks of that parent end up kind of getting pushed out of the nest and the starling chicks survive. So that can certainly impact them. Um, and then bullfrog, they uh, can wreak a lot of havoc for some of the native amphibians. Uh, they really change the dynamic of that system um, in, in those places where they've established. So wildlife and wildlife conflict. Um, so looking at some of the uh, conflicts that we have, we'll kind of pull out the main uh, issues that I uh, described earlier. Um, but wildlife as a public health and safety threat. Um, and this could be, you know, there's a whole host of diseases that wildlife will carry. Just like humans host a whole lot of diseases, as do our animals, our pets, dogs, and cats. Um, some of the more common uh, ones that, that show up from wildlife, rabies, salmonella, plague, but there's also uh, a bunch of others. Most of those are uh, related to the, uh, would be picked up via feces. So if we ate the feces, we'd become sick. Um, luckily, you know, our hygiene uh, is good enough that we are able to wash most of those diseases off our hands before they go in. Um, but certainly there could be some instances where, you know, maybe a child who doesn't know any better can pick something up and put it in their mouth and end up becoming sick. But then there's some that aren't consumed. They can be, uh, uh, you know, with parasitic or uh, sustained through a bite. Um, traffic, uh, traffic hazard. So wildlife is a tra traffic hazard and that occurs. Uh, generally it's when we have our larger animals like turkeys or geese that are crossing the road. Could be a coyote, you know, we have a lot of coyotes that run in and out of, of town on the edges. And, uh, you know, certainly it's startling to see something run in front of you and natural reaction is to either slam on your brakes or swerve to avoid it. Those two actions right there are uh, a good way that, that accidents happen. You know, certainly a person falling too close could collide into the back of you, or you might swerve out into a bike lane and hit a bi you know, pedestrian or a bicyclist. Um, it happens so quickly and you know, we don't have a whole lot of time to process. So they can cause a, a traffic hazards. Um, but also attacks. So these would be like direct biting, uh, scratching. Um, well, it's very rare. Uh, it would mostly occurs if someone is attempting to uh, handle or is in a position where they have uh, mother wildlife that are protecting their young then they will become aggressive and defend themselves. And, and that's how typical bites are, are sustained. Um, aesthetic impacts, I kind of 
Well, I didn't really mention. Um, so these would be the things that are just unsightly. We don't like seeing them. Um, this could be the feces from, say, we have a nesting owl in the front tree and they're pooping all over my lawn, regurgitating their pellets. I got to deal with that on a daily basis if it bothers me. But um, luckily for me, it doesn't bother me and I let it sit. Um, but they can nest on structures. They can, you know, some people think the swallows nests that uh, uh, form up of the ledges there uh, can be unsightly, especially if you're planning on selling your house. The last thing you want is a prospective buyer to see that. Maybe if you're lucky, they're very supportive of wildlife. Um, but a lot of times they uh, cause an issue that people want to remove them. And then there's the noise. So the same things like these little baby swallows when they're in there squeaking for their, their bug uh, to be delivered, they can be quite noisy. Um, similarly, at nighttime when owls are nesting nearby, the young are constantly begging for food. And that can be a more of a conflict when we're trying to sleep and they're uh, wide awake and therein lies the, the conflict. Um, wildlife can cause property damage. Um, we generally see this when there's nesting or roosting uh, in attics or crawl spaces in our structures. Uh, they can gnaw into the fascia boards like these squirrels have done here, and they can climb up there and form a nest. Uh, I might want to close this. We have, a, uh, I think, a, some sort of Greek, student Greek function next door, so it could get a little rowdy. Um, thank you, Robert. Uh, so the, then once they're in the wall, that may not be the end of the world. Certainly they can bring in parasites, fleas and mites and these sorts of things. There could be a smell, uh, feces and urine deposit, but they can also start gnawing on things in there. And that's where you get into a little more, uh, a little bit more concerned about structural integrity. Uh, they can chew into the wood and the walls, the irrigation lines, insulation, and they can do some damage on the inside. In the yard, a lot of people see digging uh, in the landscaping, new plants being uprooted, uh, grubbing while the animals are looking for uh, little beetle larvae or insects. Um, they can really make a mess. They can tear up your landscaping. And then public utilities, we deal, that, deal with that um, in the public works department. Um, in our stormwater conveyance channels and stormwater tension basins where we need to maintain the integrity of these facilities uh, so that they can safely handle flood water when it happens or if it ever happens again. Um, but that could be things like beavers, for example, building dams out in there, restricting the flow of water. Um, and it could be like muskrat or ground squirrels that are nesting into, or rather burrowing into the sides of our um, detention basins, which uh, compromises the integrity of those, those structures. Uh, Mention resource competition. So again, fruits and vegetables, they're delicious. Everybody likes them. Um, Pets and pet food. So I put both of those up there. Pet food, very delicious to a lot of different wildlife. Uh, pets, equally as delicious to a certain number of predatory wildlife. So we got to be real careful about them. Um, this is an interesting photo from West Davis. Uh, these are two raccoons. This is a grape arbor with lots of, you know, the grapes don't show up too well in there. Oh, there's a bunch hanging there. But anyway, they're busy snacking on these. And the resident got out there and snapped a photo, and what's interesting is that we have a leucostic um, or, or a light-phased raccoon. Um, that's just a genetic mutation. You don't see it too frequently. Uh, in fact, you don't see it anywhere in Davis except in West Area, which suggests that there's a, um, there's a little isolated population over there that are not making it to this side of 113, which isn't a surprise. Um, so white raccoons in West Davis. And then the space, in, space invasion, which I kind of mentioned before, and this is simply that the, some of those people um, just don't want to share their space with wildlife. Uh, if something's in their yard, they're either frightened of it, they don't understand it, they want it gone. So it could be a you know, snake. A lot of people are creeped out by snakes. I don't know if it's in our DNA or you know, somewhere in our evolution, we some, you know, but a lot of people do not like snakes. Um, it's like spiders, and I don't really, I know they're creepy, but anyway. Um, so uh, skunks, raccoons, these sorts of things in the backyard, they may not be causing any physical or aesthetic damage, but just the fact that they're there could be a problem for some, some folks. And I mentioned habitat creation and removal. 
backyard example again. Look at this. This is beautiful. This is, this is wildlife's dream. Lots of cover. There's nectar. There's probably some fruit and veggies. Uh, I don't see any water, but I'm sure it's there because it's a nice, lush garden. Um, and then there's um, uh, natural, ha natural habitat, like uh, open land that was occupied by wildlife, but then gets turned into something else. So in th this case, there's burrowing owl living out here, and then they're selling the property ready to develop it. So that's a bit of a, a problem. Uh, disturbances I already kind of mentioned, so it could be noise, dogs, cats, pedestrians, uh, tree maintenance. We're having an issue right now locally where we have uh, PG&E's contract crews going through and trimming up uh, trees. It concerns a lot of folks for obvious reasons. We're in the peak of breeding season right now. Um, you know, it just takes one misguided snip to take a nest down and, and there's a, a problem. PG&E does follow some guidelines to uh, do some pre pruning surveys to look for nests and they avoid trees that have them in there. So at least they have some mechanism in there to protect them. This is actually out at the Wild Horse Ag Buffer. Um, you can see off-leash uh, dog, that's a real problem. There has been a real problem, it seems to be a little better now, but there's a lot of burrowing owl out there, so we wanna make sure that uh, you know, people's dogs don't run up and snag one and kill it. Uh, supplemental feeding, so this is um, basically loving wildlife to death. So people like to have wildlife around. Their yards might attract them, but they might e be interested in trying to provide additional elements, bird food, for example. Um, but you know, a lot of times feeders are, are put out there, they're not maintained, and diseases can actually, uh, it becomes kind of a little hub for one bird that's sick comes in, eats, deposits its virus or whatever, another bird comes in that's otherwise healthy, and boom, he's got it, and it can spread that way. So uh, consistency is another issue. You know, we might put them out there when it's convenient for us, but then, you know, gosh, they're going through a lot of bird food. I'm just gonna stop putting it out there. And now you have all these birds that are like, hey, where's the food? We don't know where to go now. It's the middle of winter. What do we do? A lot of those birds end up starving. Um, habituation could be a real problem. So they might become reliant on that food source and unable to find their own. Then there's the unintentional feeding. I already mentioned pets and pet food. Um, but trash, that happens a lot. In fact, uh, that can be a real issue with uh, coyotes. And it just happens that that's not a coyote. It's some sort of wild dog that's eating a trash can, but he's a good analog for a coyote who might come in and dump a trash can. But interestingly, coyotes as well as other wildlife love all the fruits and veggies as well. So it's not just the garbage. Um, and then mentioned before, a lack of tolerance. So here we have this, what I think is a pretty cute opossum, uh, but a lot of people look at that mug, especially when it gets upset, it hisses with all its teeth and it can be quite frightening. It's this giant rat that looks fierce and it's not a rat, but anyway, it's, uh, it, it, it can be a real problem for some folks. So this is the quiz portion of the evening. So I hope you were all paying attention. Actually, you didn't have to pay attention to any of that in order to, to, to um, answer this. But what I'm looking for, uh, so in, last year we received, I received about 62 uh, calls that were, there were way more calls than that, but these were specific complaints about wildlife. Um, and I want you guys to call out what are the five top um, species that were complained about out there. Squirrels, turkeys, raccoons, no possums, no coyotes. You might be surprised. Honeybees and gopher snakes. <laughs> but good job, you got raccoon, fox, uh, sorry, squirrel and turkey. And those are actually our habitual offenders. Those are the ones that generate over the last uh, many years. Um, the last many years, those are the ones that have generated the most. So just for comparison, here's 2011, 2012, 2013. Uh, raccoon at the upper line, we had four calls, 24 and then 15. Wild turkey, seven, 11, nine. So consistently on people's minds. Fox squirrel, one, five and two. And then honeybee, you know, it pops up every once in a while and gopher snake rarely uh, every once in a while. And the gopher snake is really just a, that's a concern. I see a snake, is it poisonous? And so it's like, all right, well, what does it look like? 
the beauty of it is, in, you know, our ability to pull out the cell phone, snap a picture, I can get that email right away and be able to tell them, it's a gopher snake, congratulations. Um, it, it, so that's nice, and it, it doesn't require me to have to go out. But on occasion, you know, there's a gopher snake in my wall. Okay, well, hmm, what are we going to do about that? Because they're not fearful of the gopher snake, they're actually worried that the gopher snake's going to die in there, and they want to try to salvage it. So, um, you know, I'll go out and help assess the issue and then provide direction. Generally, it's poking a hole in the wall and tearing, tearing it out of there. It gets quite expensive. <laughs> Seal those holes up. That's important. Exclusion. Okay, so conflict resolution. What do we do? You know, we're get, getting these calls. People are, I, there's a opossum on my fence. What am I going to do about it? So the city's general policy is to promote non-lethal ways of, of dealing with wildlife conflict. Um, and and the, the main ways we do this is through outreach and education, um, but we also implement hazing on certain species which uh, respond well to hazing, and I'll explain what hazing is in a little bit. Um, but also uh, population uh, monitoring and then management as necessary, and that can be uh, a whole host, the management can be a whole host of different treatments, if you will, to habitat to change behavior and use. Um, the city looks at lethal removal as basically a, a you know a last a last tool in the toolbox, if you will. It's the last thing we would go for, and the city would only respond with lethal removal if there was a clear public health and safety threat. So that opossum in your backyard, in your backyard, is not going to be considered public health and safety. So then education and outreach. Now here we go. We're back to this opossum. I don't know if you've seen this before. This was uh, made its way on the internet. Um, I don't know if it's real or if it's a spoof, but it's pretty funny. Um, and with these, it's a picture of a possum if you can't make it out. And it des describes it as black tan with gray fur. It's a male, doesn't have a collar. Oh, and by the way, it's a found cat. So this person is under impression it's a cat. It's not very friendly. I think it might be scared. Um, and it's not housebroken either, frowny face. So. <laughs> Um, it says on Sunset Boulevard, I have to imagine in my mind Sunset Los Angeles, and therefore there's uh, somebody who's a little misguided. But anyway, outreach and education, at, at the very minimum, our hope is to have people be able to positively identify an opossum rather than a cat. Um, so uh, what does that entail? Well, a lot of it is phone advice. So like I said, I receive these phone calls with people going, what do I do? And I help them through uh, the conflict that they're in. Um, sometimes property visits, depending, uh, community events. Hi, my name's John. Um, and school presentations, which is a lot of fun because kids, you know, they like to see pictures of wildlife. They have lots of interesting questions. And everybody's got a story about wildlife. Um, there's also uh, uh, things that we'll do is we'll look at, uh, oh, some of the things that we communicate are, uh, I think most importantly, the species behavior and life history of each one of these wildlife that may be causing an issue. I think that is important because it helps people to understand the animal, why it's doing it. And it, sometimes that gets them past the fear of it into a little more appreciation for what it's doing there. Not always, I mean, if it's digging into your wall, you're not gonna be able to appreciate that. Um, so then there's conflict resolution strategies, which is um, helping people out with coexistence. So to say, look, you know, you got to take a step back or forward and that animal, you know, not literally, but, you know, meet somewhere in the middle. Um, try to figure out how both you and that wildlife can use your backyard. Uh, it's not always possible, but sometimes it is, so it's good. Um, and then uh, recommendations for deterrence, and deterrence are, uh, well, I actually added a slide here to help explain that. So deterrents are basically methods that uh, we can arm ourselves with to deal and coexist with the wildlife out there. So I broke it down real simply into what works as far as deterrents and what doesn't. Um, persistence, that's number one. You gotta be persistent. You gotta stay on top of it. If you're gonna go to the negotiating table with wildlife, you gotta keep meeting them. You know, keep talking about what's going on out there. So. Um, you know, if you start putting deterrence out, if you start looking for holes around the house where they might be getting in, you got to keep going. You got to finish that. Um, speaking of which, exclusion, very important, especially when at home. You have to, uh, you know, constantly monitor around the house. Look for anything bigger than a quarter. 
Um, that's going to allow some form of wildlife in there. Obviously, insects and maybe snakes can get in through a smaller hole, but um, they're less interested in being in your house than, say, a squirrel or a rat um, who might find food or, or cover in there. So, yeah, monitoring the home, fixing, um, fixing those holes. Um, also, if uh, you have a skunk who might be uh, utilizing an old wood pile in your backyard that, you know, now the wood uh, burning ordinance, we might all have a little pile of logs that it's kind of quietly rotting away in the corner. That's beautiful habitat for a skunk. They'll get in there and they'll have their babies um, and then they will hang around your yard. So excluding them from that by either disturbing the pile or removing it um, or covering it and sealing it, um, that's going to be important. Uh, removing food and cover and water. Um, wildlife, like humans, need those three basic things in their life. They need cover, they need water, and they need food. If you remove one of those, it won't necessarily deter them. They'll go find, you know, if I move food and cover, that's important, but they're still going to be able to go find those things maybe in my neighbor's yard. And if I have a pond in my backyard, they're going to come there for water because that's the easiest way to get water for them. You know, if I remove uh, two or three of those elements, I'm going to do a lot better to dissuade them from being there. Um, Motion-activated sprinkler is a good, um, a good deterrent to employ when you have a lot of critters that you don't want in your backyard. Um, these are an interesting thing that just, you know, hook them up to your hose, they sit in the off position, and anytime something walks in front of it, it triggers a one to two second pulse of water, and then turns itself back off. Um, works well for cats, you know, if you get cats coming into your garden, you don't want them pooping in there, you can put that out there. Um, Works good for solicitors, too. So if you don't want solicitors coming to your door, you can plug it out there, and they're not going to come. Um, but warn your, your mail person, because they may get a little bit upset. Um, Davis Ace carries those. So turkeys, raccoons, opossums, skunks. You know, we've used them for my uh, partner, and I have used them for uh, chickens, uh, our chickens, to keep them out of our planting beds in the backyard. We lost that war, by the way. But that motion-activated sprinkler uh, gave them a, a real uh, solid run there for a while. Uh, squirrels are a challenge. Um, it depends on what the impact is, but if they're rooting around in the garden, there's not going to be a lot except meshing and you know hardware cloth to build things. You can try those motion activated sprinklers. You had to set them pretty low to the ground in order to have them break that beam. Um, dive in there. Cutting back the tree limbs. Um, that's if someone says I have. Well, and I actually can give you a perfect example. I've had somebody call in and say. I have a prize persimmon tree. These are, these are award-winning persimmons that I'm producing on my tree. And the raccoons and the rats are coming up there and they're eating them. And I don't want that to happen anymore. OK. So I tried to explain to them, there's not going to be a lot you can do. What you can try to do is put flashing, uh, so steel flashing, two feet at least, about that much around the base of the tree. I wrap it around the trunk. And that can reduce their ability to scramble up. Now, two feet is. It's not very long. We try to recommend as much as you can get on there because you know those ground squirrels can leap, or not the ground squirrels, but the tree squirrels can leap pretty high and they can get above it and gain purchase and run up there. The other thing you need to do is protect the canopy. So they run along the wire, there's a branch on the wire, boom, they're in it. You have to cut it back eight feet minimum. So you know you think about that. Is that even possible? In a lot of cases, no, in a backyard. That those squirrels can jump eight feet from wire to tree, and that's in a straight line. If the place where they are is higher, they can jump considerably further, because then they use their gravity. If it's the other way, you know, we don't have to worry about it. Maybe a shorter distance, they can't jump up quite as much. But they're... <coughs> right. Um, for squirrels, it's a challenge. And again, it depends on what the, what the issue is. Sometimes we have to resort to trapping to, to knock them down if you really are, want to value you know, or protect whatever it is you're, you're, you don't want them engaging in.